This is the story of Justin Wren, an MMA heavyweight turned humanitarian who is responsible for over 60,000 people in the Congo having access to fresh water. When most people picture MMA fighters, they imagine a dude named Kyle, whose weekend activities growing up were monster-fueled bar fights and punching a hole in your wall right after ripping off his Affliction t-shirt. Let me bang I man. do let you bang. Hey. Let me bang you too, man. I let you bang. Let me bang you. I let you bang. Let me bang you. 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 I mean, you're not not right. There are plenty of those types of fighters. Hang with the boys. Hang with the boys. The boys. But for every emotionally unstable violence junkie, if you swing for the fences, I'll eat it. No problem. There's somebody who took up martial arts as a way to combat the bullying they faced growing up. Justin is the latter. The abuse was as frequent as it was ruthless. In third grade, that's when I started sitting at the lunch table by myself, getting pelted in the back of the head with chocolate milk spit wads, food, fist as kids walked by. I remember middle school, it really ramped up. And there's a kid that's now in jail, I think, for like armed robbery, but he just blindsided me with a football helmet in the back of the head. I didn't even see it coming. No warning. Me and him didn't have any beef on the field, nothing. And all of a sudden, I just got smacked upside the back of the head with a football helmet and while I went to the showers showered up didn't want to tell on them take my clothes throw them under the bleachers and leave me a little hand towel to towel off with and uh, the girls volleyball games going on and my clothes are underneath the bleachers and then I guess the kind of big moment was I got invited to my middle school crush's birthday party her name is Jennifer and uh, her dad worked at Dr. Pepper you know so she was super popular super cute and I was trying to impress her catch her eye and her birthday party was a costume contest Batman Superman different stuff like that but she loved transformers so i wanted to catch her eye so i went all out her favorite transformer i found out was uh optimus prime so i decided to make myself head to toe dr optimus pepper my mom's like jennifer's gonna love this so i thought i was gonna rock it i had the invitation and it was gonna be dope and got there mimi opened the door her grandmother wow jennifer's gonna be blown away she's gonna love this so i, I was feeling like being a kid that grew up for five years being bullied from third to eighth grade this right. is 13 years old I actually feel like, oh, I can stand a little taller. Like I don't have to be so timid or hunched over or just like unsure about myself walking into this party. I went all out. I'm going to catch her eye. This is a shoe in. So walk to the backyard, open the door and I'm greeted by my peers. And man, I'm blasted with a couple flashes of light and my eyes adjust and I hear the sound of laughter and I see that not one other person's dressed up. It's just me. And they're taking pictures of me and I hear Jennifer say, I can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. Tyler, next to her, said, you're worthless. But Justin, the one that notoriously bullied me from third to eighth grade, this was his like mastermind, his, or his uh, brainchild. Um, and this wasn't the first time he had done something, went all out, you know, got everybody in on it. And I remember Justin saying, you should just kill yourself. So yeah, 13 years old, I started the biggest battle of my life, which was against depression and suicidal ideation and, you know, a couple of attempts in my life. Anytime I would go into like a place of darkness or depression or desperation, like I would think these three things, you're worthless. You're not good enough. Maybe you should just kill yourself. I mean, and the, take out the maybe. You should just kill yourself. And that was on like repeat on like a record player in my mind for 20 years almost. Justin's hardships would push him to want to take up boxing. Although his mother was afraid of the brain damage that could come with such an endeavor, so he settled for wrestling. Justin dedicated his days to training and would go on to become a two-time All-American in Greco-Roman wrestling. Although an ill-timed injury right before tryouts would sideline his plan of becoming a Division I wrestler. But after he healed, he decided he'd try his hand at MMA in order to remain active in training. Justin quickly put together a 10-in-1 record, which would get him invited onto the Ultimate Fighter. And I wish I could say it was all happily ever after from there, but his life took a turn when his demons locked him into a cage with his scariest opponent yet addiction. His substance abuse led to him hurting the ones he loved most. Like when he missed his best friend's wedding, which he was supposed to be best man at. His increasing unreliability would even lead to his fight team, which was made up of all-time greats like Shane Carwin and Rashad Evans, to reach a nearly unanimous vote in favor of his exile. Justin has mentioned that it was upon reaching rock bottom that he realized he had spent his whole life fighting against people 
instead of fighting for people. I started working at the Denver Children's Hospital, became mm -hmm. an official volunteer there. And what was so cool about that, bro, is I did it for about nine, 10 months and like really immersed myself in it. Went through night school to become an official volunteer, wheeled the kids around in the wheelchairs and just went from room to room and had a blast for over six months. And I do that every week. But then I helped at the rescue mission, the at-risk youth group, and just had my head on a swivel looking to make a difference somewhere. The premise is just basically a hero is someone who sees a need and takes action. They don't need a cape or superhuman strength. They need a compassionate heart, a humble heart. That's what a hero has. They just do the next right thing. They just see a need, take action. Although he said his mind started to become scattered, not knowing where to go from here. So he decided to try something new and pray in hopes that God could show him a path. And I wasn't a praying dude, meditating dude. I wasn't any of that, but I needed an answer and I was hungry to hear something, if that makes sense. Like my soul was craving it. And I said a prayer by myself and said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? That's all I said, literally completely sober. And I'm taken in this vision and I'm in the rainforest and I'm walking down a footpath and then I hear drumming. I'm literally clearing vines and thickets out of the way and I'm on this footpath that's barely wide enough for my feet. It's like a smaller footpath. I'm going through this massive, thick, lush jungle and I, then I get closer here singing, very distinct singing, like almost like a yodeling, a tribal yodeling. And then I get into this clearing and I see these twig and leaf huts. I see these huts and I meet these people and the people, the first person I see, I don't talk with them or anything, but I see them and kind of meet them. He's coughing and his ribs are poking out and he's starving. I know that he's sick and that he's hungry and that he's thirsty and that he's poor. He's oppressed. I knew that I knew that he was enslaved. Yeah. I just knew it. I came out of that vision and felt like they were forgotten, that they felt forgotten by God and forgotten by people, that they were the forgotten people. So I wrote on top of a piece of paper, forgotten. Under that, I wrote hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed, enslaved. I wept for these people that I didn't know, didn't know who they were, where they were, and I was actually confused by it. I actually felt a little crazy, um, was really questioning myself. Did I just have some sort of psychotic break? It was like it happened. It wasn't something where I was observing. It was something I was there. It was so real, so vivid. And when I came back out of that vision, like it broke me, bro. And I was confused because I was just limited knowledge. Like I thought rainforest, Amazon, like Brazilians, Peruvians, um, or I thought India, or I thought like Thailand or right. Asia, but I didn't think Africa, but the people in my vision clearly had dark skin. Mm -hmm. They were black. And I was like, who are these smaller people with darker skin who are so oppressed and hated? And, um, I didn't communicate with him. I just had this knowledge about him. Although he was hesitant to mention his vision to anybody. As even he admits, if somebody else told him this story, he'd be highly skeptical. But he decided to confide in his one friend, Caleb, who had experience working with tribes in Africa. After describing his vision in great detail, Caleb replied, I know who you're talking about. Those are the Umbati pygmy people. And if there's anybody on this planet who's forgotten, it's the pygmies. Caleb was supposed to go back to the Congo in three weeks. And despite the airport that they were supposed to be flying into being taken over by a rebel group who were hunting, beheading, and even cannibalizing the pygmy people in the streets, Justin and Caleb decided to go against US State Department advice and hop on a plane. After treacherous travels on just about every mode of transportation you can imagine. We get out, we're walking, and all of a sudden we hear drumming. We're clearing thickets and vines out of the way. Our guide has and translator has machetes that's clearing the path for us. I mean, people have walk, walked this before, but it gets thicker, right? So you have to clear it. We're drumming, then we hear singing. We come into a clearing, bro. First guy we meet, his ribs are poking out. He, coughing, same person from the vision. And it was too big of a sign to ignore. Justin is now the man behind Fight for the Forgotten, a nonprofit which exists to empower the most bullied people in the world. From the enslaved pygmies in Africa to the youth in our own neighborhoods and schools. They've drilled 75 wells, impacted tens of thousands of people, even secured 3,000 acres of land for the pygmy people and they show no signs of slowing down. The story of Justin's life has undoubtedly changed mine for the better. Growing up, I was an outcast. I did everything I could to fit in, but I often fell short. Before hearing him talk openly about his struggles, I had always thought that my past depression was something to be ashamed about. It felt like a hit to my masculinity. Hearing Justin, who can smash 99% of the people on this planet, Tomorrow night, I'm gonna smash your boy, guys. Talk openly about his depression made me realize that showing vulnerability isn't a lack of strength, 
but rather a testament to it. That is often the soldier who wears the most amount of armor that is least confident in his ability as a warrior. And I had always thought that I was too small to make a difference in anyone's life. Until I heard him say, If you think you are too small to make a difference, try to sleep in a closed room with a mosquito. And although anything I've done in the world of fundraising and charity can't touch what Justin has achieved, I can attest to the true sense of fulfillment and purpose you get when fighting for people, not against them. So, Justin, if by any chance you see this video, if you ever need a hand with Fight for the Forgotten, whether that be video work, fundraising, or an extra pair of hands to dig wells in the Congo, I'm game, no strings attached. And I know your fight with depression isn't over. So I just want you to know, if it wasn't for you and people like you, I'd still be living in a state of depression. So thank you for being the true definition of a hero.